Hi and welcome back to the channel. Now I think a lot of people are quite concerned about AI, uh, saying that it might spell the end of the human race, uh, saying that we're shooting ourselves in the foot, people like Elon Musk, people like Stephen Hawking, people like the historian uh, Yuval Noah Harari have all talked about the dangers of AI. Well I think a lot of us lay people are grasping around in the dark in terms of what it really means. So I thought it best to reach out to the experts and in this connection I reached out to someone named Pulkit Agrawal. He's an assistant professor at MIT in Boston, and this exactly is his field of study. As always, if you can, uh, like the video, tell me what you think in the comments below, share the content around, and subscribe if you can. And so, dear viewers, without further ado, may I now present Pulkit Agrawal. Pulkit Agrawal, a huge pleasure, a huge privilege to be um, chatting with you in, in front now at ASB. Um, you are an artificial intelligence engineer at, uh, at uh, MIT, of course. Um, why don't you give us a bit of a context in terms of how you landed up in, in your role at MIT and how, in your area of study? Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here at ASP and talking with you. So I was really fascinated uh, with the brain. And brain is about circuits that led me to do electrical engineering first in India at IIT Kanpur. Very quickly, I realized that, you know, by studying circuits, we couldn't really build intelligent systems. You know, and I decided to go back to the brain to study what we can learn from it. So I joined Berkeley to pursue my PhD, you know, spend some time in neuroscience, and we were working on this fascinating project to read brain. So imagine someone who cannot speak, but we can read their thoughts and convert it into uh, speech, right? So could we enable those kind of technologies? So what I realized is that maybe we have some progress in algorithms, but not so much in the hardware. And I wasn't a hardware guy. So I decided I'll you know concentrate more on building AI systems than I, started doing more computer vision, you know, how do we learn by using less amounts of data, got into robotics. And then the dream really is to build a robot which can do whatever humans can do. And that remains a research area to pursue which I started my lab called the Improbable AI Lab at MIT, where I joined as an assistant professor in 2019. Yeah, so the study of AI um, is not a new one. I think it's been around for at least perhaps three decades, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's really this year that it's really caught fire with um, ChatGPT and, and you know, it's the various big corporations that have really gone to town with it. Uh, share prices at NVIDIA have just gone through the roof. Big tech is back in vogue again. Um, at this point in time, what do people need to understand about how AI is being developed, Bukit? It's a excellent question about you know, AI being there for a long time. And I think there have been a couple of AI winters also. So it's not that it has been only started this year, right? So it was in the making since 2012 when the first big deep networks came out. So speech processing, you know, machine translation, there were technologies which people are using quite a lot when you're talking with Siri on your phone or talking with Alexa, you know, you are interacting with AI. I think what has happened is for the first time with ChatGPT that people are able to interact with AI systems very naturally so that your mom, your grandmom can also go and interact with an AI system. I think that user interaction is new, right? But I think with any technology, if it is used in a way which is unchecked or we don't understand it completely, it can have, you know, bad consequences. You know, I do think the technology is powerful and has many good use cases. And there is a lot of potential. But the, the thing is, um, you're an engineer and engineers, well, they tend to be very, very focused in what they do. And mm -hmm. it's all about the innovation and the advancement of their field of study. Um, and some might say, uh, there's a school of thought that perhaps engineers might not have the 360 uh, perspective in terms of the ramifications of what they are studying. So so that the breakneck speed at which AI is being developed is far outpacing by an order of magnitude the, the evolution, which is the, the organic evolution of the human race. And a lot of people are concerned. Uh, Stephen Hawking has, has mentioned it. 
Elon Musk himself has talked about it. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari has talked about it. At, at, at some point in time, there might be a Skynet uh, scenario, you know, Skynet Terminator 2, where the robots take over the human race. Um, where are we in terms of that perspective, uh, Phuket? Yeah, so, so I would say we need to change the narrative over here. And the change is due to the fact that any technology, when it comes in, it has pros and cons. You know, when the internet was coming in, people didn't know what to do with it. You know, when nuclear power was being innovated on, people didn't know what to do with it, right? There was this whole potential to generate energy, but also this potential to do harm. I think, you know, as engineers, you know, you have to deal with a lot of disciplines. Now, what you're saying is true, that engineers have not been trained to do policy making, to judge ramifications of what the technology could impact the society in ways beyond just the innovation itself. But I think in the history, engineers have worked with, you know, policymakers, with corporations, with people from social sciences, you know, to come up with a common platform where we can lay down guidelines and principles for how the technology should be used. So I think this is something we should do more of. And if you look at how things are being done, you know, it's the innovators of this technology who are pairing up with social scientists, with people who are studying ethics, people who are studying morality, people who are going to write down our laws to ensure that we can use and harness this technology for the best of mankind. Now, the problem that you're saying that the technology is advancing at a speed which is much faster than what laws have come out. You know, on one hand, it is true. On the other hand, people should also realize that this is not new. You know, once the internet was there, you know, all the privacy laws came much later, right? It's That doesn't mean that we should not, you know, make laws faster, but also to realize that this is something which always happens with technology and there are set patterns in how people who develop technology and people who regulate technology can work together and should work together so that we can maximize the benefits of the mankind. Yeah, um, you're right. And with certain technologies in the past, we have come to the brink of you know global disaster mm-hmm. and we pull back from it. I mean, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1960 uh, where you know the um, the Russians and the Americans were this close, this close to bombing each other, right? Yeah. But we didn't. Uh, but the thing is, with AI, it's all encompassing. It's mm-hmm. omnipresent. It's 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 omniscient, and it's it affects every single thing, right? Um, and this is said as much by you know Kathy Wood at Ark Investments. She looked at AI, and AI is the one thing that traverses all twelve verticals that she invests in. So, it it is it is so powerful of an order you know, on a scale that we we have never fathomed before. I mean, nuclear can be one vertical, uh, automotives can be one vertical, internet is one as well. Um, but the thing is, we, we don't yet know the full ramifications of something as powerful as this, right? But when, 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 when I look at some of your field of study, and you have said there's, there's a natural impediment with AI because, well, AI is, is basically reasoning skills, right? And reasoning skills, as you argue, uh, require less, much less computational skill and ability than motor sensory skills. And motor sensory skills, as you argue, has taken millennia to evolve, literally billions of years, right? And it is something that robots can't do. They can't walk over uneven terrain and different grounds. They can't open doors. Well, they can, but very clumsy. They can't pick up, they can't wipe a table where, you know, milk has spilled. And these are simple tasks which, which we take for granted, but they can't do. You argue that robots need both. Uh, reasoning skills and motor sensory skills in order for AI to flourish. Why? So I think, you know, it's not necessary for AI to flourish that we need both the skills, right? So if you think about AI, it has become an umbrella term today. You know, there's an interpretation of AI, which is about crunching data and trying to make decisions based on data. And this was in the making. Internet came along and it helped us digitize all the information. So it was natural for the next generation to utilize all the information put on the internet. So a lot of what we are seeing today, like ChatGPT, 
or when we say that ai can be spanning many domains like finance you know banking or you know services you know that is what i mean that it's all the data on the internet which is getting mined right now there's a different aspect which is being in the physical world right so today people are in warehouses lifting heavy boxes 24/7 today people have to go into sewers to clean them you know if there's a disaster humans are going in those environments to save people now these jobs are dangerous you know people should not be doing them right people should have a choice in what they pursue and what they not pursue and be able to pursue things which are safe and humane right so i think for those things you know robots are a great option for them to do those tasks now if i need to have a physical system it needs to do some common sense reasoning of what to do and what not to do if you say clean a house you should not put your cat in a dustbin right you know that would be erratic right so there's a aspect of reasoning involved over there to understand how humans do things what is done what is not done and there's an aspect of how to actually do it which is the physical intelligence part so i think for those problems we need both digital intelligence or reasoning and physical intelligence you're right but there's there's also a conundrum here and mm-hmm. it's you know obviously is described by the term moravec's paradox which is robots are good at reasoning skills but very poor at motor skills right um but we can't have our cake and eat it as well mm-hmm. uh, can we right book okay. it we we might want them to do these things and do the kind of jobs that we don't want to do like mm-hmm. even perhaps going to battle right with um opposing military forces but it is that the reasoning skills that we are human kind is at most of being disrupted because that level of intelligence is the one that they are very very good at and they can work 24/7 365 rather any rest and without any nutrition they just need electricity and that's the most concerning part um there's a school of thought that while you can't hinder or uh constrain development because it's a race it's a, it's a it's an ai race around the world you can address deployment uh and this is a school of thought that perhaps someone like Yuval Noah Harari might might postulate right in in the sense that you have to manage how fast and where ai is being deployed Do you agree that 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 should happen? And if so, how do we do that at, at a practical level because the business lobby have so much power and they are the ones who have most to gain from basically robots that are able to influence the way you vote or buy things. Yes, yeah, so I definitely agree that before these technologies are deployed, you know, there should be some legal framework, there should be some policy framework. in context of which these technologies are deployed right even when we deploy cars there's yeah. a whole certification process which and, cars and have to drugs as well. come through same for drugs right for similar things should also be there for ai systems where you know for example if you're using ai system to screen applicants for job interviews then we better ensure that that ai system is fair right and then if i go on social media and there are bots on the social media which can influence elections you know the social media companies should have a responsibility to at least flag that these you know accounts are bots and these are not humans it could be as simple as you know a policy saying that why don't you know that every every account should be flagged if it is real or fake now i do understand this might not be an easy undertaking but it's something certainly implementable Well the thing is um the previous battlefield for the human mind mm-hmm. was in engagement right mm-hmm. that's what people like google and and instagram and you know facebook and they all do uh youtube to some extent but now it seems to me that the real battlefield is in terms of intimacy and 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 connection because when you are spending a lot of your time as we humans do nowadays o- online and we are communicating with, with other people online you can't tell whether the person that you're talking to is a human or but and they might convince you that for example voting for candidate A is better than candidate B or being perhaps a bit more lenient in terms of why perhaps Russia invaded Ukraine you can influence those thoughts especially those bots were generated by the Russians themselves who want to for example um cultivate public opinion in their favor right 
should policymakers, and perhaps this is something you can tell me in terms of where MIT is, is approaching this, right? Should, should governments outlaw the impersonation of human beings as counterfeit human beings? And if so, how, we, how will we do it in a practical way? Do the developers themselves at organic level, like yourselves at MIT, say, hey, let's do this and do this in terms of managing and harnessing the power of, the power of what we're doing? So I will express my personal opinion over here. And, you know, definitely in the broader MIT ecosystem, people are working with policymakers and, you know, other interested parties to come up with what, you know, these value systems should be. Because that's really the big thing. Like, you know, you, you have a self-driving car. The self-driving car can pass the driving test, but can still fail to drive. You know, when humans pass a certain test, you know, we have some trust in them that if they pass this test, they're going to do well. But the problem in evaluating AI systems are that they fail in ways which are very, very different from humans, right? So there could be a machine which plays chess really well, and you change the chess board to 7 cross 7 or 9 cross 9 or change a single rule, and it might completely collapse, right? So humans, if you look at what humans do in some narrow domain, we can generalize how they might behave in a broader domain which is not true with machines. And this is why the problem in evaluating what machines are going to do in the larger context, right? Now, coming back to your question of uh, if, if a machine is personifying someone else, you know, should this be blocked? Should this not be blocked? Should, be, should it be legislated again? Should it be illegal, in fact, right? I think, you know, if you look at things like a social security number, right, impersonating a social security number is it's illegal. Ill, is illegal. It's illegal. So by the same philosophy, you know, anything which has to deal with your privacy, you know, a person has rights over their privacy and that should be the choice of the person if he allows it or doesn't allow it. Now, there are some people who might benefit from it, right? For example, I might want to uh, license my voice, you know, if I am a famous artist and I can make money out of it. So I think the legislation should give people a choice in how they control that entity instead of being very prescriptive on, you know, what it should be. What are some of the AIs being developed around the world now? Because it is a race. The Israelis are looking at it. The Americans are looking at it. The, Jap the Chinese are looking at it. The British, the Russians, everybody with you know, a, a huge surplus of engineers, the Americans, for sure. I mean, you are sitting in America. What are some of the use cases being thought of and, and you know, developed right now? So a big thing which happened because we just came out of COVID is using AI technologies to develop new drugs, you know, new antibiotics, you know, new antivirals. And the idea being that the machine can look at large amounts of data which a human scientist may never be able to look at it, just given how much data is available today to potentially come up with better drug designs. You know, similarly, you know, no doctor could look at how many number of x-rays or ultrasounds which a machine can look at, right? Then, you know, similarly, if we just think about how much knowledge we are, you know, generating today, and no scientist is even able to read these research papers. So imagine, you know, machines which can read research papers, you know, read the news and come up with their own experiments to conduct. So almost like making an AI scientist, you know, which is going to be an assistant to a scientist in coming up with new experiments, new ideas, new hypotheses. And that is really powerful as an idea because it could remove a lot of the boring, mundane things which you end up doing in research to push forward the frontiers of what we know in science and technology. Right now, of course, there are crazy things, you know, like space exploration, or how do we make better batteries, you know, or how do we, you know, make robots do our household chores. You know, there's an you know, revolution happening right now with so many humanoid robotics companies, you know, going public or coming out publicly in the past three to six months. Yeah, yeah. So so you've been looking at the human brain for a number of years and you've been involved in robotics for 12 and AI for 12. Um, what do you make of um, 
well, humankind's biggest fear, which is that robots can become sentient, right? And this is exactly what Blake Lamoa at Google, he's one of the engineers, eh? he went public with the Washington Post about how the AI models that he was interfacing with started to show uh, signs of emotion and humor and, uh, you know, compassion and things like that, which is very shocking to people at the time. Is that possible? I mean, was he full of BS? Uh, or was he, what he's saying, is it, was it true? I think one thing one has to realize is when humans look at things, they really attach emotions to those things. So there's this famous experiment, right? Uh, it's called in the book called Vehicles by Brattenberg. And the experiment goes as following. There's a car and there's another car which is following the first car. There's a light on the first car and the second car just follows the light. And then humans are asked to comment on what is happening. So some humans are like, oh, the second car is pursuing the first car. But some are like, hey, the second car is in love with the first car. You know, so I think humans naturally attach emotions to when they see things. So even when there's a chatbot, and when the chatbot is saying things, people will naturally attribute emotions, irrespective of if the source of what was producing that content, whether it was a chatbot or a human, had emotions or not. So I would interpret most of these things as human interpretations of you know, the words that are coming out of some software. You know, we never make software to have these properties. You know, what software is made is to optimize on some cost functions. Right? And those cost functions, you know, look like, hey, you know, produce me the most relevant sentence. Or if, you know, we have set up a software, you know, say for marketing purposes, you know, the purpose might be to increase the likelihood a customer is going to buy a product, right? But the software can get innovative in how it produces words or, you know, what kinds of suggestions it provides a user to maximize its objective. Yeah, it's it's just that, um, I understand what you're trying to say because it's an, inter it's an interpretative um, issue, right? Blake Lamoire could easily have been in misinterpreting what he was, in, you know, getting from the robot. But I guess... Because of the speed of computational process now that's that's involved, um, the concern is that the robots eventually get smarter than humans and they will leave the humans in the wake, in the dust, right? And, and they might just say, um, I don't want to do these functions, I don't want to do these commands, I want to do something else. Is that even possible? I mean, at, at all, from an engineering perspective? Can the machines start to develop their own intelligence? So, I think if there were no guardrails at all, and if I were to be an absolute optimist, I think that is possible where, you know, machines are able to do things much better than a human. But does that mean that machines are sentient or conscious? You know, does that mean that machines are going to destroy humans? I think those are different questions. Right, I think consciousness and intelligence are two very different things. Right, so we have tools in, by which we could study intelligence. You know, we really don't have tools by which we can study consciousness or sentience. Right, I mean, if we were to go on a philosophical discussion, I'm happy to you know chat about it. By all means, <laughs> what's at stake here? <laughs> right. Um, but maybe let's let's start with the okay. more concrete stuff, and okay. you know we'll we'll yeah. we'll come back to it. Um, wait, sorry, I lost track. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to discuss whether robots can become smarter than humans. Yeah. So if yeah. yeah. So yeah, robots can become you know as I was saying, like if I was an absolute optimist, robots can become smarter than humans. They can but do hang things. On. Why would you say if you're an absolute optimist? So you're talking as an engineer, right? You want the the machines outperform expectations, right? I'm yeah. saying absolute optimist because, you know, today's robots, they can't even open doors, right? I mean, they are so far away from doing physical things. Now, if I talk about intelligence on the internet, right, I say, hey, you know, find me, you know, how to repair my car, right? I could expect a software to go look up, you know, many you know, source of information on the internet, compile that information, give it to me and say, hey, here is how you do it. 
right? So that it can do much faster than I can do because, you know, I will not be able to search so many links so quickly and synthesize it, right? Or if I, you know, a famous thing that people are trying to do is to give, you know, I, you know artistic style to things that they're writing. So you come up with, you know, some article and you say, write it in a Shakespearean style, right? And the machine would write it in that way. So in some ways, the machine could be creative. It could be smarter than what humans are. But, you know, these machines or this kind of smartness is not going to hurt humans, right? The reason where it can hurt is if we deploy them in social media, right? Where it can influence an outcome of an election, right? So when I say, you know, that if I if there were no guardrails in place, you know, then these things can start harming humans. Now, the argument that people make is that, hey, because if these machines become so smart, we wouldn't even know where to place the guardrails, right? And, you know, and what would happen in that case. But I do think, you know, as creators of this technology, you know, when we are deploying them, we always know what we're giving them access to, right? So, you know, if we maintain, you know, a good rigor, then it is possible that we can, you know, have these machines be way smarter than humans, but still working for betterment of humanity instead of going against it. Well, that's the thing. You're, you're using words like if and could be and would be, right? But at this point in time, it seems to me at a layman level that engineers are not putting those guardrails in place because it's a race. It's a race against time to build a faster, better, smarter uh, robot than the next country, right? So those guardrails are not necessarily being... It's not the priority right now. The priority is speed and the priority is advancement. Am I right in, in sus sus suspecting that? I, I I don't think that's a completely fair picture to paint. So even if you look at, you know, when OpenAI released ChatGPT, they did put in substantial amount of effort to make sure that, you know, when ChatGPT did not know the answer, it would say, hey, I don't know the answer. Or it would say, hey, you know, I'm a chatbot. Uh, well, it didn't though, because I, I tried ChatGPT Ch Ch mm -hmm. or OpenAI and I said, um, who's Kusu Chuang, right? And it started off accurately. And then it started to editorialize in a magnificent way, mm -hmm. saying that I'd written books and it gave the titles of those books. Mm -hmm. it, it said I studied in places where you might have studied, but I certainly didn't. And I was, I was quite impressed by my CV. But it was all, it was all um, <laughs> fiction. Hallucinations, right? It was all hallucinations. Yeah, exactly. So I think hallucinations. So there were no guardrails in place. They just gave, gave me those um, details. So I, I think maybe you're talking about two different things, right? So one is the effort which was put in to ensure that the content which was being generated, you know, did not hurt people. It was not unfair. It was not unethical. Like they did put in guardrails around that. The problem you are referring to is that these models were hallucinating content. Yeah. And this is a real problem, right? And, you know, this is where, you know, if you look at, you know, when Bing tried integrating chat GPT, when they were generating summaries, they tried having sources Correct. which were being cited. Right, so which it's, were fictional, which in were certain cases, yeah. in in certain cases, yes, which has now made the research community, you know, go into the direction where they can like, hey, can we give you actual sources of information? Right, so if you look for a recent hearing which came out in law, where if you were to present some documents in the court, you know, it has to be certified that you know a human produced those documents. Or if some AI system was used to produce those documents, then a human has to verify all the sources which were listed. So I think, you know, thinking of a society where it is completely human or completely machines is maybe not the best way to think about it. But how do we put machines and humans together, right? And the guardrails are really coming in by the fact that humans are checking the output of those machines and not just taking it for granted. You know, I think that might help people use the technology right now as we are figuring out how to build those guardrails in a more rigorous fashion. Yeah. Um, well, it's okay for me to, um, I guess, you know, 
um, contextualize what I'm getting from ChatGTP, ChatGPT, because mm -hmm. I'm 51 years old. Mm -hmm. I've been around the block a couple of times, mm -hmm. and you know, one gets to separate fact from, from fiction. But the, the the ramifications really come in the field of education yeah. when you've got you know Definitely. undergrads or secondary students when they don't have to study history anymore, they don't have to study geography anymore, they don't have to study calculus anymore because they just input the question into ChatGPT and for, or whatever other application there is. And they get an answer because it, it it renders the whole educational process superfluous, right? Um, assuming it is right and what they give you is correct and accurate, let alone ethical and moral, right? But um, we haven't addressed those issues because if what ChatGPT really can do and, and AI can do, we don't have to go through six years of secondary school, three years of undergrad, one year of master's, X number of years of PhD. We can just go all the way to the end and then and do all the fun stuff which we want to do with AI, right? But we've got these issues to discuss. So I think it really you, what you're doing is really questioning what is education. I think right. so, yeah. Right? right, and you know there is a theory that education is about knowing a certain number of things, of having mastery of some subjects. Now let's consider how jobs are evolving and what's happening with the workforce. There used to be a time you joined a company and you would remain in that company for the rest of your life. But now people change jobs every two years, every three years, right? And with the rapid growth in technology, people want to you know, keep, you know, change jobs even faster because old jobs may become irrelevant. So what you really need is this ability to change quickly rather than really knowing a lot about one thing. Right, so the education system, a lot of it, what it tries to do you is to teach you how to process new content, right? And when you're doing your homeworks and assignments and exams, it's really trying to teach you that rather than what is that thing that you're giving the exam on. So it's almost like you're practicing and practicing of how do you quickly learn, right? So in that context, you know, I would presume that if people just use ChatGPT to ace all of the exams, they would never have the skill to learn things by themselves. And at that point, they are going to struggle. And you know what this means for the education system, but what it means for educators is that we have to perhaps change the way we are evaluating, the way we are teaching people right now, so that it becomes more apparent that really what we want to educate people is to pick up new information quickly, to assimilate new things quickly, to be more creative instead of, you know, just cram everything and go as an exam. Yeah, and there's a lot of moving parts here, Phuket. I, I think you, of all people, would understand um, the, the value of a marquee education. I mean, you are obviously a very smart guy, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, then you went to Berkeley, one of the big Ivy League universities in, in America, then you landed in MIT, which is, I guess, the, the apex, you know, it's the big dog of the um, educational establishments, right? Um, you can't get any better in some sense than MIT. But then the marketplace will value you very high in, in the hierarchy because of your ability to be extremely disciplined, to work hard, to process information, to then put it out there in a clear fashion, uh, and, and then you get to specialize in the field of study which you have. Um, if AI reaches its logical conclusion, that whole educational um, paradigm will dissolve because you don't have to go through that process anymore. You can sit at home and qu make inquiries of these, this disembodied intelligence, and you get the replies instantaneously. What happens beyond that, though? What is the future of education what does the future uh, worker look like if this has happened and, and will continue to happen at a very fast rate? So imagine a world where there was no education, right? Maybe the world which is, you know, a couple of, you know, thousands of years back, right? I think children and humans came up with games to play with each other, right? And they were still smart in what they were doing. So... You know, I think if it was the case that an AI system, you know, came along and it made, you know, all access to information be very easy that I can query anything I want to query, right? Then 
you know the purpose of people knowing facts will no longer be there because you don't need to know facts i can always look for it but i think at that point the humans might find a different value system they might make up their own games then and start playing them mm. or you might imagine you know which some people talk about that you know if that were to happen there will be universal basic income and you know people have access to the basic means to spend their life and what they spend their time doing is pursuing their more artistic the fun stuff while the, the robots the fun take stuff. on all the mundane jobs right yes that would be the holy grail that would be a possible future which would be you know allowing people to pursue what they dreamt of to yeah. pursue and then you got things like neuralink mm-hmm. right and in elon musk's idea of the neuralink world is when there's chips embodied uh, embedded in your brain um that is obviously quite um intrusive because you've then got this ability to um in very very short space of time learn new skills whether it's computer science whether it's you know video editing whether it's to speak five different languages you then buy those chips and then if i want to speak german right i just buy the chip which says german or just upload the the information to my chip and then bob your uncle that takes it again into a different world entirely what do you know about that part of um industry so at least for speaking german i wouldn't buy a chip you know <laughs> i, <laughs> I, mean, I would take you a few months to learn german right but if you can just put in the chip which, which then easily in, in within a second enables you to speak german no i can speak german today just give me my phone you know Absolutely. whatever i'll speak yeah. will come out in german right no i i think this technology of implanting chips in the brain if we think about you know neurological disorders you know i think curing them or if you think about you alzheimer's know dementia, alzheimer's mem- but even yeah. if you have an accident yeah right then how do we use you know current technology or how do we use some aids that we develop for the brain to restore function I think that would be amazing that right? if someone cannot speak or if someone you know lost their eyesight but then they you know did a surgery but then you need to still reconnect you know your eyes back with the brain so in that space of things it looks like an amazing technology which could really change the quality of life for many people I think for injecting information into the brain now if we really believe and which i think will happen that you know if i query an ai system on the internet it will have all the information so just putting information in my brain doesn't seem like a thing i should be doing or i i would want to do now um so i, I don't know why someone would do it so i would really think of these chips as you know maybe sim- emul- simulating some part of the brain so maybe it could you know increase my learning abilities or if i have some loss in my brain function to modulate that and you know some you know so if you think about when people say brain reading right what is brain reading that brain yeah. reading is interpreting neural activity happening in the brain and converting it into information so for example if someone cannot speak i can record brain activity so i know what are the words and then i can convert it into voice right but that is an example of providing functionality to someone who has lost their natural brain function and that to me is the frontier in that field yeah and uh, obviously the medical ap- applications are uh, uh, gi- ginormous right obviously there would be very very positive benefits but it's like the automotive right the automotive can either take you from a to b in a sh- in a safe fast way or it can kill right mm-hmm. uh, the thing is the automotive is 125 years old and it's been you know obviously regulated but we don't have those guardrails in ai right um what are the parameters by which mit engineers such as yourself um you know entertaining in the, in your minds when you work on these technologies do you have a self you know modulator in mind uh, and how, what what kind of thought processes are, are, do you entertain so for instance you know when chat gpt was coming out you know there has been a lot of discussion about you know 
how we should regulate the output of chat gpt you know when it is used in deployments you know for example how do we guarantee if we are producing code automatically that code is functional you know if there is language being produced you know are we are we being culturally sensitive to different diverse groups right so for example in my group one of the students he was starting collaborating with someone doing ethics and someone doing public policy to figure out what principles we can come together with so i think with academic institutions the one great thing you know which happens is that you have people from different backgrounds but they're really melting pots for these kind of discussions to happen which would not happen so naturally maybe you know at you know big corporations at a private sector that. level right because they would have something commercial in mind and then reverse engineer that situation they so, might not have those guard guardrails in place so is uh, that a concern see whenever you know products are involved and money is involved you know there is a scope that someone will try to rig the system and only care about the money that they're going to make right but i i don't think it's always the case that people go just for the money by floundering on all the guardrails so even if we look at the deployment of self driving cars you know the authorities the government authorities and companies have been working together so i don't think it's fair to just say that all companies are flouting the rules and doing whatever the heck they want to do so that they can put their technology first right and similarly you know i think you know i mean and what you're saying to some extent is true right when engineers are building systems you know they don't think about how those systems are being going to be used right and for a long time in ai it was that these systems are you know not even powerful enough that what are they going to do so let's just first build the technology but i think in the recent you know 3 to 5 years that perspective has started to change and there are conferences which are dedicated to studying fairness right to studying safety and universities are also hiring faculty in these areas who can sit at the intersection of what machine learning ai is doing and what we might need to deploy these systems in the real world so you know i don't want to take a position which is to say hey we are doing everything correct right but i think you know it's also very human and very natural to be afraid when we encounter something which is completely new right so if you watch all alien movies the reaction is aliens are going to be evil right but aliens could be good too right it just makes for a good narrative that new things are evil and maybe it has evolutionary roots that if we don't understand something if we have no experience with it it's better to be more conservative and be more careful so i think really the the lining or the take away is that you know as we are deploying these system let's be more conservative let's not rush into it right but i don't think we should you know prevent the research or the development of this because if someone stops the other person is not going to stop right which happens well in, it's a race isn't it so it yeah. i mean it it is a race right definitely it is a race right so there's no point stopping the race i think there is definitely a big point to be made about the output of the race should be regulated once it goes for public consumption there's a point about educating the public on how to use this technology of making them aware of when to trust and when not to trust this technology so let's forget ai for a moment like just talk about whatsapp or just talk about you know any of these social media apps there's so much fake news going off on all of these apps right you know and it's it's the same problem so i don't think it's a fundamentally different problem it's just what has happened is the amount of fake news that we can now generate you know could be way more right but at, but this is not an ai problem <laughs> it's just like the problem with digital media today of what to do right so i am not trying to protect ai i'm not trying to you know say that you know everything is you know bad with technology 
I think what I'm trying to say is that AI has potential. It what its potential is, what its downsides are unknown to the public. And but this does not mean that you know people should be afraid of it and we should be you know having dialogue on how to make this technology to be best for the people. Yeah, and obviously sometimes that suspicion emanates from ignorance, right? Because what they don't know, people fear. Um, why do you think uh, Elon Musk is having so much trouble with his self-driving cars? What are the impediments there? The big impediment with self-driving cars is that the long tail is really long. You know, what do I mean by that is rare cases are really rare, right? So if you are driving on highways today, you know, that is something which people are getting fairly comfortable with. Now, when you come to cities, you know, someone crosses a road and you don't see it, you know, but at some point, you know, there is, you know, two children, you know, doing something and there's, you know, a bicycle coming from somewhere else and it's snowing and it's raining. So if most, if these systems are based on data, then the more data you get, the hope is the performance is going to be improved and which is what we also see empirically. But then if you get new kinds of data, which you have not seen in your training set, the performance of these machines is not as good. So what happens is, you know, you drive your car, right? And most, you know, self-driving would say, you know, a human would be near the driving wheel to detect when something bad is happening and they can take control of the car, right? So that that's the way of doing data collection, where they're figuring out what kinds of data are not in the training set so that they can include that data back into the training set and improve their system again. But the world being as diverse as it is, we keep on finding these corner cases. New data sets, right? Which yeah. have not been in the training set. Which data. have not been yeah. in the training set, right? So, so like, you, might, you might develop your car in the deserts of Arizona and yes. extreme heat, but then you take the same car to India, then you've got a multiple of other ramifications as well. Cows. Yeah. Humans, yes, mice, yes, yes, <laughs> um, potholes, mud, right, landslides, yes. which you never get in necessarily in, in Nevada, right? Completely true. I think that's really the problem. That's Ackley's heels of most of systems built on data that they might appear to be doing reasoning as humans do reasoning when tested on some narrow domain, but the moment you test their abilities on a much broader domain they behave quite differently from how humans do, right? I mean, I, you know, or, you know, many people in the world drive in one country, in one city, but they have no problem going to, you know, new cities or new countries. Yeah. Today's AI has those problems. So are we years and years away from completely self-driving cars on that evidence? Or maybe even never to, to attain that? Because as you say, the world is very diverse. Different climates, different terrains, different weather patterns, and constantly changing as well. So I don't think, you know, it all depends on when we decide to accept self-driving. I don't think it's going to be, Fully, you yeah. know, a black or a white yeah. thing. No AI system is going to be perfect. You know, even if you look at humans, they are not perfect. I think what should we talking about is numbers in the sense of, you know, how many car accidents happen if human drivers are driving you know how many accidents happen you know when if the cars are being controlled by self-driving ai technology and i don't mean to account for you know any accident which happens when a driver is drunk right i mean you can also account for when you know people in the full you know concentration are driving a car you know what happens at that level right so so I think depending on those numbers, we can make a decision on when to start accepting them. And then it also depends on how to accept them geographically. You know, maybe on highways, we can accept them first. Maybe in some parts of cities, we can accept them first and then go to other parts of the city. So I think what we'll, what we'll see is a gradual progression instead of it being, hey, one day self-driving is there. I, I don't think yeah. it's going to be like that. Yeah, conditional application and conditional deployment. Well, I, I know you don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to, you know, uh, just take a few more minutes of your time. 
But um, you would have seen Apple recently launch its headset. I mean, there's headsets galore nowadays, right? Where does that use case end up? Where does it look like in the what does it look like in the future? What are the possibilities? So virtual reality, you know, has been a dream for a long time. Uh, there are many potential things that one could think of entertainment being one of the biggest ones, but also as, as educational tools. I'd imagine that you're learning how to do surgery, but you could get this immersive experience of doing surgery on a virtual human being, you know, that could make you a better surgeon, right? To think about flying airplanes, right? We have to build these expensive systems to emulate you know, how to fly an airplane. But suppose if we could reduce that cost, you know, that would be amazing. Now think about if we could link some of these virtual reality systems, you know, to brain chips, you know, which we discussed, you know, some time back. You know, if someone, you know, has some disorder, if someone has some part of, you know, some, you know, some part of the body which is not functioning as it should, it could, you know, improve with that. You know, same goes for physiotherapy, or when, you know, you're recovering, you know, these things could be helpful over there. Yeah, so maybe in the future, the brain speaks to the headset or the, whatever hardware is on, mm -hmm. on your body and mm -hmm. communicates that way. But having established that link, it then also then means it's a two-way street, right? And the, one of the holy grails is that you can read each other's minds or now, right? Or well, these governments can read your mind. And again, it's like the classic, um, you know, pros and cons right is it is it a very beneficial or it'll, it'll, it can also be a weapon of destruction so i think the idea that if you can communicate with the mind you can read all thoughts yeah might be is that possible might be too much of a fiction mm -hmm. you know i would presume that when or not not i would presume i'll be more specific over here because then you will say i'm saying could maybe <laughs> 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 and you know, so what I'll say, so when we are interfacing with, you know, particular parts of the brain, right, we might interface with something which controls the arm, something which controls the leg or something which controls the retina. So we'll really be interfacing with specific parts of the brain, right, to, you know, access, you know, virtual reality or any other forms of technology we are interfacing with. Now, it could be possible that you could read all the neurons together and therefore, you could be processing all the information in the brain and that gets uploaded on the internet. But I would say a much easier way of doing that is what people do anyways, posting about their lives on social media. Yeah. So gaining more information than that is, you know, unlikely that you're going to get that. I think maybe we should, you know, more likely is that by crunching the information that people already give. Is it at all possible, uh, and being aware of the you know the motor sensory limitations of each individual? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are you could be more or less uh, coordinated than the next person, right? But in the future, could you have that you know c cerebral link where everybody can play like um, Roger Federer tennis, right, or drive a car like drive a car like Max Verstappen, irrespective of your you know innate skills? Is that possible? You know, if you don't have a fit body, no matter what you do with the brain, okay, you so couldn't. You, still need you side, couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't play that, right? I think it's body and the brain put together that makes you who you are. So, I mean, I would, you know, even. I mean, I have. I'm not an expert in this area, but if you consider people like Michael Phelps or Roger Federer. I presume yeah, people. Well, Michael pre Phelps is six foot four, and he's got muscles on his muscles, right? And he trains like a dog. Well, he used to train like a dog. Yeah. But the question to be asked is, you know, if there are people with similar bills who are putting the same number of hours, you know, how do they compare, right? And probably they don't do as well. And the question is, why not? Mm. I think that is one of the biggest mysteries that we don't yet know the answer to. Okay. Well, okay, let's end with your thoughts on how humans, you know, at, at an everyday level can... I guess, position themselves or prepare for or strategize for this future, which you are right in the thick of things in terms of its development. But, you know, at everyday level, we, we really have no clue uh, what's in store for us in the future. How can humans, I mean, how would you advise your son, for example, Pocket, to prepare for this future? 
so our first thing i would say is learn you know how to pick up new things quickly instead of you know just trying to you know learn one thing very very well which i think is a great thing to do which we should all do but don't ignore the fact that you also have to learn quickly the second thing is if you are getting information you know go for the source of information don't trust it blindly which i think will negate a lot of the content being generated by generative ai which if it was being used for false purposes but i think this fact checking is going to become more and more difficult but i think just having that awareness the same way people had awareness of privacy at least let some governments like the eu to formulate privacy laws right so i think knowing that will or having that at back of the mind will make it part of the political discourse which i think is a crucial aspect third would be you know this technology is new but it has you know benefits also and don't think of that it's ai versus humans i think it's ai and humans working together as a team where we really think of things that we don't want to do and see how this technology can take all of those things which you know makes me feel more tired <laughs> and you know really gives me back my time and the energy and yeah. choice to do things that i want to do and to proceed with that outlook and perspective to see what guardrails we should put right and maybe some things we should never give access to because that would mean we will not be able to put those guardrails in place if i can just get you to re- to refine your first point which is well not just the ability to learn new things continuously but what kinds of things should they what should people be learning i think it wouldn't really matter right what kind of things you're learning so if you look at kids they make up new games all the time and just they keep on making just to be adaptive to re- to respond to the situation you just you, you just yeah. want to be adaptive and respond to situations right it's the same thing if you go to space if you don't use your body you know you wouldn't be able to walk right after some point if you don't exercise it so in the same way if you do, if you stop using your brain you know you wouldn't be able to use your brain at all so the danger really is that if you are on your mobile phone on your computer all day and you never do any thinking you're just accessing information then all you become is you know like an excel sheet which can take inputs and outputs but you're not really using your brain yeah so you have to use your brain somehow you play a game you make up your own game you study courses i think that choice people can make the fact that's being just keep on doing different things your brain is active absolutely okay well thank you pocket an honor and a privilege to talk to you thank you good luck with your research well thank you so much for having me it's been fun chatting and i hope i did not deviate all of your questions with could be's and maybe's <laughs> okay. well, thank, thank you. you thank you